So I started writing this book when I was about 31 or two. So I was quite young to write a memoir. And I realized that also that, you know, what, what did I have to say? But really, because it's not only about me, it's a multi-generational family memoir. Um, and, you know, the, the other people I write about, my father and grandfather, led very interesting, turbulent, uh, um, traumatic lives, particularly my grandfather. Um, I thought there was a lot that was interesting to say there. Um, and particularly because I'm a historian by trade, uh, I really thought that the what I brought to the writing of a memoir as a historian, um, you know, I, I had something different to say than many memoirists that, that you read. So I sort of brought my background, my training, my skills, my lens. Uh, and in that way, I think that... Um, even though I was quite young and it's quite unusual for someone in their thirties to write memoir, although I think, I guess it's becoming more common, you know, I'm reading a lot more memoirs from people in my generation and cohort. Um, I think that that sort of bird's eye lens that I could apply as a historian really helped kind of separate it and, and make it something a bit unique. In terms of what brought me to writing it, you know, to a large extent, it was grief. My father passed away in, at the end of 2015, and it was really just a way to process grief. I started writing about six or eight months after he, he died, and I was trying to figure out how do I process this? And just one way that I processed many of the things I, I encountered in life was to write. So I figured writing was, was one way to do it. And, and as I wrote, you know, it occurred to me that there were bits of this story that were kind of unusual. There were bits of the story that hadn't been told enough, particularly in the context that I was working in. You know, I'm a historian of um, Jews of the 20th century, particularly survivors. And there were just parts of this story. And I, at the time I was living in Charleston, South Carolina. And so many aspects of this story were completely unknown or untold. Like people used to be surprised that there were Jews in Melbourne. Um, you know, the story of my grandparents' survival in Siberia during World War II is something that's only recently getting scholarly attention. And certainly in the body, the vast body of Holocaust memoirs, there's not that much that describes that experience. So there were just a bunch of aspects of the story that I thought were worth telling. And I can read a passage that, you know, helps explain um, where the book came from. So I'll, I'll do that. This is from the, the preface. My father believed in ghosts. He saw ghosts he claimed as a young man living in Papua New Guinea and again in his suburban Melbourne apartment, a headless lumberjack sitting at the end of his bed in that instance. These stories were part of the repertoire of experiences he drew on, although they seemed to me to be his most fantastical. As with many other stories he told us as we were growing up, it wasn't clear what the lesson or message was or how it fit with his broader understanding of the world. Although he believed in ghosts, Dad was an avowed atheist, a socialist, skeptical about religion, faith and the afterlife. He had little patience for religious rituals, for synagogues or for God. That his father had lost his first family to the Nazi onslaught was enough to convince him there couldn't be a God, at least not a benevolent one, one to be revered, feared. A strong anomaly, these ghosts. This is a book about ghosts. Not the ghosts that my dad saw in the jungles of Papua New Guinea, but the ghosts that have haunted my family for three generations. The ghost of my grandfather, my Zayda, who died six years before I was born and who haunted my dad through most of his adult life. The ghosts of Zeta's first wife and two sons who perished in the mobile gas vans at the Nazi death camp Helno and the millions of dead Jews that they represent. The ghosts of my grandfather's father killed by German soldiers in Warsaw during the First World War. The newest ghost is my father's. Since he died in 2015, his voice and presence surround me echoing through me as I teach, write, and raise my son. His ghost stands with me in the classroom and in the streets, hovering, watching. It lingers constantly in all my thoughts, decisions, and actions. I see it everywhere, in my dreams and my nightmares. It's inescapable. It's comforting. It's terrifying. It is the ghost that compelled me to write this book. 
the ghost that convinced me there were such things as ghosts. Yeah, so I, the answer is yes, um, but they weren't the same kind of texts as if you'd gone to Mount Scopus or Yavna or if you, you know, your Jewishness was situated in a shul. So, you know, I went to um, Sholem Aleichem College, the, the Yiddish day school here in Melbourne. And, you know, the texts we read were Yiddish writers, Sholem Aleichem, Yud Lamed Peretz, um, poets like Mani Leib and Avram Reizen. But also we learned about Jewish history in a secular way. So we learned Torah, but we learned it as stories, I guess, like mo in most of those like younger age contexts. And at that time, we learned them in Yiddish. So we had textbooks in Yiddish. You know, the one I'm thinking of specifically is called Main Folk, which means my people. And it had all of these biblical stories. So we learned the Jewish texts like kids in other schools learn, but we learned them, I would say, from a secular perspective, you know, as the history of the Jewish people. And this is the kind of um, the legacy that we inherit rather than as a kind of theological set of questions. You know, the, in my Jewish education, God wasn't centered. Um, so, you know, like also, I would say Holocaust poetry was very important growing up. Um, you know, at our annual Holocaust commemorations, like from when I was about seven participating in them, I would, we would read Yiddish Holocaust poems by um, these amazing poets that lived and survived in ghettos and, and after, like Avram Sutzkever and Schmerke Kaczaginski. So, you know, these were, were really crucial. In terms of like Bundist texts specifically, you know, I think it wasn't until I was a bit older and I really wanted to sort of delve more deeply myself into the history and ideas and philosophy of the Bund in a more complex way that I went and found, you know, the, the writings and a small number have been translated into English of Bundist thinkers like Vladimir Medem, who was one of the early Bundist uh, theorists, um, like uh, Henrik Ehrlich and Victor Alter, who were murdered by the Soviets. So, you know, th those came a bit later and particularly like as I went to uni and then I did my PhD writing about the Bund, that's when I really delved more deeply into specifically Bundist texts. I, I read Yiddish better at that stage. So I had more access to those kinds of texts and the kind of language that they used, which, you know, when you're nine or 10 and they're writing about political economy, it's hard enough in English, let alone in Yiddish to, to make sense of that. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, I guess it, it's a kind of range of secular texts, particularly texts in Yiddish, um, and, and also things that revolved around the Holocaust. Those were really our like Jewish texts that we learned from. Okay, so the Bund was an organization founded formally in 1897 in the Russian Empire. They were a revolutionary socialist movement. At that stage, they were kind of underground. They were diasporists. So they, in contrast to Zionists who founded their own political movement in the same year, they didn't believe that the solution to the Jews' problems, be it anti-Semitism or poverty, should be sought outside of the context in which they lived. They had this notion, uh, which became popular particularly later called doikate, which means hearness, literally in Yiddish. The idea that Jews should solve their problems where they live. So there was that, they were Yiddish oriented. Um, so they were all about the idea that Yiddish was the national language of the Jews. Um, the, the, you know, I would say the kind of peak of the Bund's life was in interwar Poland when they operated as a legal movement. They, they were never fully legal in under the, the Russian empire, although they participated in the 1905 and then 1917 Russian revolution. Um, but they, because they were not communist, they were socialist. They were eventually um, shut down by, by the Bolsheviks. And, but in interwar Poland, they created like these, amazing array of institutions that 
allowed people to participate in all stages of their life. If it was a children's organization, a youth movement, a network of Yiddish uh, schools, sports organizations, women's auxiliaries. This is, so what's important about this is this is the context that my grandfather, you know, discovered the Bund and participated in the Bund. And all his friends who set up the, eventually set up the Bund in Melbourne, uh, they'd all grown up in this atmosphere where, you know, the Bund was part of this broad array of political Jewish movements in Poland. Um, and, you know, they were very committed to the movement, to the ideas, to the identity of the Bund. The Holocaust, uh, like for all East European Jews, was um, devastating for Bundists. Um, you know, most Bundists were murdered by the Nazis, just like most Polish Jews were. There were Bundists outside of Poland, but the center and the main driving force was Poland. And it was really impossible, despite their efforts, and my grandparents were part of these efforts, to rebuild the Bund in Poland after World War II. So what they did was they moved, they, like all survivors, they moved to all corners of the globe and they set up small Bund branches and organizations in all those places. So in Melbourne, I'm not gonna rattle off all the cities, but in about 31 cities, there were Bund, either formal organizations or satellite groups in 13 different countries. You know, they tried to recreate a slice of the world that was destroyed. So just like that, they did here in Melbourne, in Carlton, where they set up, you know, they had the Kadima in Carlton, which wasn't a Bundist organization, but that's where they gravitated towards. They had the Skiff organization. They would come to my grandparents' house in Canning Street on a Friday, late Friday night after work and toast to the revolution and, you know, eat herring and rye bread and, um, you know, like they, they built this amazing little cultural hub. The question was at the beginning of the end is a complex one, because what I would say was that Bundists adapted in each place that they arrived at because they had this notion of doikate, of hearness, of responding to the circumstance they found themselves in. Um, you know, I think maybe it's, it's not the right way to frame the question was at the end, but more how did they adapt to their circumstances? It's true, you know, the only formal Bund organization that's left is in Melbourne today. There is um, a Bundist um, organization in Paris too, and there are Bundists in Israel and there are Bundists in New York. Um, and it, to be sure, you know, there were ways in which the events of the 20th century made it untenable in a lot of places to have a Bund organization. But the Holocaust is one part, only one part of that story. There's sort of bigger historical forces that also mean it's difficult to rebuild after the war. Um, so certainly the Holocaust is, is a factor, but um, I can recommend another excellent book by a historian named David Slukey on this topic, um, which, you know, sort of looks at that, you know, that was my first book was to look at the post-war history of the Bundists and, and basically how they tried to make sense of what they had just gone through. Yeah, it's possible. Um, you know, I, I think my dad code switched in a way. So at home he was Schmulek or Muller, like Muller was his kind of the nickname for Schmulek. Schmulek was his Yiddish name. He was named, you know, like partly he was, he shared the name, whether he was named for him or not is, we, I, I don't have a definitive answer, but he shared the name of his half, one of his half brothers who was murdered in Helmno, who was called Schmulek. And Schmulek, the half-brother, was named for their grandfather who was killed during World War I, my grandfather's father. So whether or not my dad was named for his grandfather or his half-brother, it's kind of immaterial. He shared the name. And I think, you know, I don't remember dad ever talking about it, but I imagine that must have been a burden for him that he carried really through his life, this notion that, you know, that I think what it created for him was this set of expectations. 
because his half brother was murdered at 15 years old. Basically this like unfulfilled potential that my Zeta saw that my dad had to live up to. Shmulek, the first Shmulek could have been anything. He was an, you know, from my Zeta's letters, um, I read he was an earnest student. He was very involved communally. And so I think, I don't think my grandfather deliberately put this pressure on my dad, but I think there was a sense of like living in the shadow of that first Shmulek. And that must have been difficult. So I don't know if Sluggo, being Sluggo out in the world uh, was directly a response to that, but it, it certainly may have been a factor, you know, a way of like him being out in the world and being just a regular Aussie kid, you know, playing cricket on the nature strip in or the median strip in Carlton. Um, or if it was just like all the kids that are in his circle had nicknames, like this is, you know, when I was growing up, all his friends had nicknames, you know, Sluggo, Spud, Nudy, um, you know, they all, they were all referred to by these nicknames. And this was something like that dad, one of my dad's cousins talked about that he did when new kids started at Skiff and my dad was a, like a counselor, a helper, he would get, assign them all nicknames. So it's possible like that this is a way of kind of inducting them into this Aussie culture and sort of having a foot in both doors. So at home, you kind of like eat the herring and, um, you know, you speak in Yiddish, but out in the, and you're Shmulek, but out in the world, you're Sluggo and you play cricket and um, eat meat pies or ham sandwiches. Actually, they ate those at home too. <laughs> I mean, like, because I'm a Jewish writer and I'm writing a book about, you know, um, sort of partly about Jew my, my Jewish reaction to, to guilt. Certainly, you know, like I did not grow up with reading Talmud or Soloveitchik. But, you know, I teach Jewish history at, at the university level. I, I read more widely than I did when I was raised and I incorporate more different kinds of thinking um, into just how I think about being Jewish. Partly, I think it's a condition of the being a Jew in the 21st century. You know, I, I, I think, like, partly this is how I'm raising my son as well, you, that you have to be a bit nimble, that you have to be able to kind of move between different worlds. Like, I was raised in a time where it was perfectly feasible, I think, to have to sort of situate your Jewishness entirely in a Bundist Yiddish speaking context. You know, my, I was around Yiddish speakers. I could speak Yiddish to at least my grandparents and I could read things in Yiddish and I could go to lots of events um, and sort of find community. And that still exists to some extent, but I sort of think about raising Arthur and, you know, who's he gonna have that environment with? So I kind of feel like, you know, we, we probably need to be a bit more, like I said, nimble, I think is a good word and be able to kind of be comfortable in different types of settings. So, you know, I, I'm not a Talmud Chacham, but I, I certainly am more interested in, um, you know, reading different kinds of Jewish texts than I was raised with and, you know, fostering an interest in that in my son and within my family context, you know, I would say, um, where, where observant might not be the right word, but like our Jewish practice at home is quite different in lots of ways to what I grew up with. Um, you know, we didn't have a regular practice of Shabbos dinners or switching off phones on Shabbos when I, not that we had cell phones on Shabbos, but back then, but you know, th these are things that I'm much more conscious of today. Be you know, partly that was living in Charleston, South Carolina, that basically meant like, we had to rethink what it meant to be Jewish because there were no, there was certainly not a Yiddish speaking community there. And, you know, the Bund was our little apartment in Charleston at that time. So we really had to kind of make it work in different ways. And, and I think that's reflected in ways in the book, like, you know, partly like referencing Rabbi Simlai and Soloveitchik, 
but also just I think um, I think as generations go on, like I have more of an openness to that to incorporating different aspects. You know, like my dad is still the the child of a generation that was born traditional, broke away from that, and raised their children with a kind of antagonism towards um, traditional Judaism. Even like in my family, we were very, there was a big emphasis on respect because we had very close and very from cousins. Um, so, you know, there was always a big emphasis on, and my grandmother's parents who survived with them were, you know, Orthodox as well. So my, you know, my dad grew up with Orthodox grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins. So even though like, you know, there was, he always talked about the Heretz respect um in practice i think you know it wasn't for us and like now i think we just live in a different world to the 1980s and 90s and we just have to think a bit differently about like what is the kind of jewishness that that we have in our home i don't know if i'm i don't, I don't think i'll write a sequel memoir but um you know, there's more I want to write about, you know, things that either didn't get in the book or, you know, things that have happened subsequently. Like I, I took the book on tour and I went to Poland and Paris and I basically did a tour of all the places that my grandparents lived and suffered. And, you know, I, I read passages from the book and I read from my Zeta's letters outside the building that he wrote them in Wrocław in 1946 and seven. I went to the apartment, my dad was born in Paris and I read from the book and spoke about it a few blocks from there. So, you know, there's, there's I, I wanna write about that experience too. And that sort of sense of, and I write a little bit about it in the book too, that feeling of that, that question of belonging and home and where do you connect to? How important is place uh, in these stories and, and that connection to a place? You know, I went to Chalno and one of the things I describe in the book is visiting Auschwitz as a 19 year old and the Warsaw Ghetto and stuff. And I think I was too young and naive then. And when I visited Chalno about a year and a half ago, um, it was a totally different experience, partly because I'm just like older and wiser and more, I don't know, cynical and curmudgeonly. But also because of the connection to that place. You know, one thing I was able to do at Chelno was go visit the mass grave that I knew my grandfather's first family were buried and probably had been burnt because that's at Chelno they had like there's one of the mass graves that is four Jews from my grandfather's town. And so I stood there and I walked along it. It's about a hundred meters long. And, you know, like when I visited Auschwitz, it was, and for anyone who's done that, it's devastating because going anywhere like that, where you even have a loose connection is devastating. But to go to where like, and, and to know, right? There's something also about knowing in that site because it's marked so clearly that the Wrocławek Jews were brought here on this day and this is where they were buried. You know, that, that's an experience that, um, that I want to write more about. So, you know, I, I do want to delve a little further into this, but otherwise, you know, I'm kind of like doing my scholarship and I'm writing on like TV shows and comedy and Holocaust remembrance and survivors. And I've, you know, I've got lots of other sort of scholarly projects on the go. And, you know, at some stage in my sort of medium term future, there's gonna be some fiction as well, um, which will be a kind of new venture for me. Um, so, so that's ahead. Um, for the Bundists, uh, I don't know, like the Bund is like alive and kicking here and they get 80 or hundred children on their summer camps. And, you know, they run these really successful programs and they pivoted during all the lockdowns last year to online programs. and. You know, like, it's an amazingly resilient movement, the Bund. Um, it has been resilient over 100 years. It's much smaller and 
you know, in terms of the sort of global Jewish discussion, much less significant than it was, you know, 80 or 90 years ago. Um, but in the, con you know, like if you look and zoom in on the, say the Melbourne context, like the Bund is a significant organization. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think that they're, they're gonna continue doing what they're doing and they're gonna continue to adapt um, and sort of like make Bundism work for the circumstances that they live in. <laughs>